white balance. You wouldn't think there'd be much to talk about, would you? But like everything Darktable, it comes with options. So let's dive on in. Hi, and welcome to episode 35 of Understanding Darktable. And welcome to my Patreon supporters too. Thank you so much for your support. White balance. What is that? Well, let's have a quick history lesson. If we go back to the days of film, we would generally buy film designed to shoot under certain lighting conditions. And 99% of the time, that was film that was daylight balanced. Now, if you were a working professional photographer, you would generally carry coloured filters for those times when you needed to shoot under different types of coloured lighting. You may not have given it a whole lot of thought, but different types of artificial light throw off different colour casts. Tungsten lighting is quite orange in nature. Fluorescent lighting is quite green. And you really notice this if you've been outside on a sunny day and you step inside a room that's lit with any type of artificial light. You step into a room lit with tungsten light and for the first five or ten seconds everything seems really orange until your eyes adjust and everything then looks normal. And it's the same if you step into a room lit with fluorescent light. For that first five or ten seconds everything seems really green but it quickly starts to look normal as the brain adjusts the white balance for us. So, back to film. If you knew that you were going to shoot under tungsten lighting with a daylight balanced film, you'd slap a blue filter on your lens, blue being the complementary colour to orange. The blue of the filter would counteract the orange of the light and give you an image pretty close to daylight balanced light. Same could be said if you were going to shoot under fluorescent light. You would take a magenta filter and put that on your lens for the same reason. Magenta is the complement of green. Now, what do we mean by complementary colours? Well, I won't claim to be a colour expert like Les Walkling, but essentially you've got a colour wheel and we can see that you know orange and blue are on opposite sides of the colour wheel. The same can be said for green and magenta. If you know you're going to shoot under lighting which is say really cool like blue then we know we need to introduce some orange to offset that blue colour cast. And so we come to the age of digital photography. Every digital camera, even your cell phone, has the ability to choose a different white balance preset prior to shooting. You've seen them. The obvious ones are auto white balance, AWB, daylight, shade, cloudy, tungsten, fluorescent, Kelvin and flash. There are some others, as we might see later on, but these are the ones that you'll see most often. Now, if you're shooting RAW, as I would imagine most of the people watching these videos would be, forgetting to set the white balance prior to shooting is not a massive problem because we can change it after the fact. But if you're shooting JPEG, it is absolutely critical that you set the white balance first because it cannot be changed after the fact, at least not without sacrificing a whole lot of quality. Just why that's the case is outside the scope of this video, but at the very worst, if you are shooting JPEG, set your camera to auto white balance and snap away. Just don't get all bent out of shape if you find that there's a shift in white balance between shots from the one scene. Is my prejudice showing? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Look, there are times when even professional photographers need to shoot in JPEG because they've got a client breathing down their neck and they want the images within minutes, sometimes even within seconds, of the shutter being triggered. 
And if you don't want that drifting white balance, then you really need to shoot with one of your camera's white balance presets. That will at least keep the white balance consistent from shot to shot, even if it's not the perfect white balance for that sequence. Your other option is to pick up one of these from eBay. I bought this set of three cards for about $5 Australian. That's probably about three euro, probably the same in greenbacks. Never used one? Okay. Basically, you just take a sample image with your model holding the cards in a manner such that the light under which you will be shooting can fall directly onto the cards. You take a test shot, and then when it comes to post-processing, you can take a reading from that section of the image where the cards are visible. And that way, you've identified the correct white balance for that particular scene. Alternatively, if your camera has a custom white balance setting, you can put the camera in learn mode, take a shot of the cards with the lighting under which you'll be shooting, and then register that white balance to one of your custom set white balance registers. Now to do that, it's different for every camera. So you'll need to either Google it or dig out your owner's manual for your particular camera. But Based on the colour of the light reflecting off the cards, your camera will determine the correct white balance for that particular light source, and every image you take afterward, until you next manually change the white balance setting, will use that white balance. Hello, consistency, my old friend. I'm sure there's a song title in that somewhere. I'm not sure why, but the white balance module although always active, never shows up in the history stack at first. If you go and alter the white balance after import, it does then appear in the history stack. All of these images that we're about to look at will show the white balance module in the history stack because I was naturally doing some prep for this episode and that naturally involved mucking around with the white balance on all of these images. But by default, any image you import into Darktable will reflect the white balance as it was set in the camera at the time of capture, and the white balance module will not be showing in the history stack. Here's an image I shot of Tegan uh, in a wool shed shoot a few years ago. The camera white balance is reported as 6,423 Kelvin. Now, there's really not a lot for us to do on this image. I shot it with flash, so I would either leave the white balance as the camera reported value, or I might try the flash setting. The flash setting comes in just under 6000K, and to me, I prefer the slightly warmer look of the in-camera white balance. You'll see on the menu that there is also camera neutral. And from the dark table manual, it says this essentially sets temperature to 6502K. The actual math, it computes the white balance channel multipliers so that pure white color in the camera color space is converted into pure white in sRGB D65. Pure white color here meaning having the same equal value for each channel equal to 1.0. I sure hope you understood that. <laughs> Let's move on to the next image. This is an image I shot with Glyn on one of his rare trips to Sydney a few years ago. It was night time, it was raining, and if we look at the image with the white balance as shot, we'll see a white balance of roughly 5800K. Now, from memory, we shot this with a CTO gel on the flash head, and we can be fairly certain of that because if we set the white balance to flash, we get that, and that 
is not how Flash looks by default. So I'm fairly confident, yes, we had a CTO gel on. Flash, by the way, has a white balance of around 5400 to 5600 Kelvin, which is pretty close to daylight. Now, probably my favorite feature of Darktable's white balance module is the preset called Spot. If we select Spot from the drop down menu, you can see that Darktable selects about 90% of the image and takes its best guess at what the white balance ought to be for this image. And I've got to say, 95% of the time, it absolutely nails it. Didn't quite get it on this shot, and I suspect that that may be due to the copious amounts of red in her jacket. Now, the thing is, you don't have to accept Darktable's guess. You can left-click and drag across the image, and just a portion of the image, to prioritise that part of the image for the white balance. And this is where that test shot of the grey card comes in. You can select Spot from the drop-down menu, click and drag across the area where the grey cards are visible, and Darktable will read the light being reflected off the cards and set the white balance accordingly. And as you can see, that did a really good job. Now, you'll notice that the white balance module has five sliders. The first is tint, the second is temperature. Generally speaking, you'll grab the temperature slider before anything else if you're planning to set the white balance manually. And you can do that. You can just left click and drag that slider up and down anywhere you like to try and get a white balance that looks right to the naked eye. You can also right click, type in a value, and hit enter. And you'll get close, but it may not be perfect. And if that's the case, you then try very minor alterations to the tint value. Now, in my experience, I find I almost never go outside of the range of 0.9 to 1.1. Anything more than that, and I find I'm looking at something that's either really magenta or really green. The red, green, and blue sliders, they're not really there for you to manually adjust. You can do it, but you don't need to. They simply adjust themselves as you alter the temperature and tint sliders. Again, in my experience, I've found that trying to adjust the red, green, and blue sliders ends up with results that are wildly unpredictable. The fine tune slider is only accessible for the camera presets like daylight, shady, cloudy, etc. In theory, negative values shift the blue yellow axis towards yellow, and positive values will shift that axis towards blue. To be honest, I don't even see a change, so I've never used it. And that is pretty much it for the white balance module. Most of the time, I shoot in a, one of the presets in my camera, or if I am really at a rush and I know that the white balance is going to change and I don't have time to change manually, then I'll go to auto white balance and I'll deal with it in post later on. The only other thing I should add is if you have shot a sequence of images and you have ended up with a white balance that differs and you really feel like every image should have the same white balance settings. For example, these five images of my mate Dave playing his guitar. If we look at the white balance as reported from the camera, I was obviously shooting auto white balance because we've got 4882, then we've got 6101, 6041, and so on. So clearly there's a difference in white balance in all of these shots, even though Dave was sitting in the same spot while I was taking all these images. So we've got varying white balance, even though all of these images were shot in the same place at the same time. So what I could do is go back to one of these images, let's say that one that Dave's actually in, 
and I could do a spot white balance and I'll go, yeah, take a reading from his face so that we get neutral skin tones there. And if I like that look and I decide, yep, we'll go with that, what I can now do is jump back to the light table, go to the history stack, go copy, select none, just select white balance, click OK, then click all of the other images in the sequence, paste just the white balance, click OK, and now all of those five images have got the same white balance. Now, to my eye, they're looking a little bit on the green side, and that's not really important right now. What's important is that you understand the process of how to synchronize the white balance across a multitude of images if you need to. A couple of other things to cover. I've built myself a very rough and ready teleprompter, and this is the first episode where I actually wrote out the entire script in advance. I'm hoping that this will speed up my editing time. We'll see how we go. I'm also about to switch video editing platforms to DaVinci Resolve. I was going to edit this episode in Resolve, but I still need to learn some more things first. Magix Vegas is just way too unstable, uh, even on a brand new install of Windows 10, and it has never played nicely with Waves Audio plugins. Also, I've created a Patreon account where you can, if you so desire, support my efforts in creating more content about Darktable. But I would like to stress that if you can't afford to support me on Patreon, or you just don't want to, that is fine. You are not going to miss out on any crucial info in the free version of the video. The onus is now on me to come up with extra content for the Patreon version. Essentially, Patreon subscribers on tiers 3 and 4 will be able to access an additional episode, which will be fairly short, but it'll be like an addendum to the episode in question. Hey guys, a late addition to this video. I was on the train commuting to work and it occurred to me if I pre-script all my videos, then I'll be in possession of a transcript before I even start. And that might mean that it will be easier for me to create subtitles in other languages. Now, I don't speak any other languages, and although YouTube does a good job of creating English closed captions, I don't know how well it'll do at syncing subtitles from a text file to the finished video. So I wanted to throw this out there. Let's say you were prepared to devote a few minutes to running my English text file through Google Translate to generate a text file in your native tongue and then run an eye over that output to make sure it's accurate and then return that translated file to me, I'd be willing to add those subtitles to my videos. Now, that doesn't really help me or you, but it might help other people who speak your native language who might struggle with English. If that sounds like something you'd be willing to help with, reach out to me and I'll happily forward the English text to you. Okay, so that's it. If you want to help out, reach out to me, let me know, and we'll um, I'll get my people to talk to your people. Fantastic. Talk to you soon. Bye.